Awesome. So I'm super excited to announce our final keynote for day one, uh, Luke Canise from Puppet Labs. Luke founded Puppet in 2005 out of fear and desperation with the goal of producing better operations tools and changing how we manage systems. His company has grown from nine employees in 2011 to nearly 400 employees today with offices in Portland, Belfast, London, Pilsen, and Sydney. Please join me in welcoming Luke to the stage. All right, so I'm here to talk. Uh, thank you very much, Seth, and, and thanks to the Mitchell and the Hashi team for inviting me to talk. Um, it's a little strange talking at this conference given the uh, real and potential for overlap between the tools, but uh, I think it'll be interesting. Um, so I'm here to talk a bit about the future of management and, and how I think we'll get there, um, or at least a little bit. I'm not a huge fan of predictions um, because I really don't like being wrong. Um, and so I'm going to mostly focus on the forces that I think are at play in our world and how those forces uh, I think are going to help determine the future, um, even if they won't necessarily allow us to tell us ex to see exactly what it is. And ideally, if you can, you know, if you believe anything I say, and it seems reasonable and rational, um, you can use these beliefs to make your own predictions, and then you're wrong instead of me. Um, so first. I think we're in a sustained high rate of change, and I think everyone around thinks we're in a, we're in a rate we're in a, an area where there's a lot happening right now. But there seems to be this really big belief that it's not sustained. That uh, we're in a we're at a tipping point. We're at a cusp. We're at this special time, and I, I think today is special. But I think in five years or in ten years, I think it's going to be just as special. If you look at Moore's law. Um, Moore's law seemed really, at any given time, there was something really interesting happening, but, but really it just doubled like every two years. And doubling every two years for as long as Moore's law has is amazing. I mean, that's geometric growth for a very long time. I, I feel like the craziness that we feel today is going to feel about this crazy for like a really long time. And part of why it's going to be this crazy is because everything is really, really bad. And the amount of time that it's going to take from everything sucking as badly as it does right now, mostly in the software, or at least especially in the software world, I don't want to mean to say that software exclusively sucks, because lots of other things are really bad too. But uh, Quinn Norton wrote this really great article um, a while back now, actually, six to maybe even 18 months ago, about how everything is broken. And probably most of you have a pretty reasonable understanding of all of the ways in which the software stack is, in addition to being mostly a lie, also really, really horrible. Um, one, of the, one of my favorite examples from the Unix world where, where I got started was that even today, if you open a terminal on your Mac, uh, your computer is being lied to and, and firmly believes that it has a, a VT100 connected over a serial cable. And it's just always been easier to continue lying to the computer about how it's connected than it is to go back and fix that part of the world. Um, and, and I think you look at just that one little thing and you say, how long is it going to be before that part of our world stops sucking? Um, I think it's going to be a while. Um, and optimistically, I think you're all going to die first. Um, um, I, I'm sure that you know, most of you are, let's say, at best, um, or worse, depending on your perspective, um, in your 20s. So you've got maybe five to six decades left of caring about these problems, and, and probably your technical chops aren't going to last quite that long. Um, and I think you, know, you can comfortably say that the, the, the rate of change that we're talking about, that we're experiencing, is going to last for, I'd say, at least that long. Um, one of the things I like about this is that this perception that um, I've got to get on now. I've got I've to catch this wave. I've got to be part of every party. I've got to join every little movement. Um, you can let go of that. You don't have to worry about missing out on something, because you can miss a wave. You can miss 10 waves. You know, it's still going to be, be there making new waves for you. And I, I think in a lot of ways, in some ways this is frightening, right? In some ways the, this, this perception of, oh my god, it's going to keep changing like this like forever, at least from my perspective, because, you know, until I'm dead. Um, that's kind of frightening, but it's also really awesome because it means that you can take the time to focus. You can take the time to be a little more patient. You can take the time to actually think about what you really want to do. Um, and, and for me, it really helps to, to give me a longer term perspective on things and not to make panicky decisions, which I think is, is pretty important. Um, 
I think the way we're going to get to the future and the way that we're going to be able to manage any of the complexity that exists in the future uh, is through more powerful abstractions. And, and I really think these more powerful abstractions are, um, are actually a, a big driver of that rate of change. Every time we find a new way of thinking about things, suddenly the world has to kind of reorient around that new thing. And that new way of thinking about things um, requires you kind of throw away the old ways. It requires that you let go of a lot of the things that you believed before. Um, and those who can build those abstractions, those who can come up with the new abstractions, a, a new tool, a new power, a new concept, are the ones who are going to push us forward. Um, and those who can't, they're still going to be there. Um, they'll probably still hold political office and things like that. Um, but they're going to get routed around. We're going to find a way to avoid them. And the reason why we need more, more powerful abstractions um, is that you know, the computers are getting smarter way faster than we are, is what it comes down to. Um, the symbols in our brain do get more powerful, obviously. In a lot of cases, the abstractions we're talking about are exactly those, those symbols that we're, that we're thinking of. Um, and humans are evolving. There was an article in the Times recently about humans are evolving more quickly uh, than we thought, um, but still dramatically slower than software. I know I'm not ge getting geometrically smarter on, on any time scale, although that would be pretty sweet. Um, and in the end, you have a pretty fixed cognitive load. There's only so much stuff you can fit in your brain. And if you want to be able to do more, if you want to be able to manage more complex infrastructure, if you want to be able to move faster, get more done, be more productive, you have two choices. Find a way to have a bigger head where you can fit more stuff into, or find a way for the things that are in your head to be more powerful, and for anything you do with them to essentially have a, a, a larger impact. And software is evolving very, very quickly, right? It's getting more complex, it's getting more critical, um, it's got a much higher rate of change, and it's far beyond your ability to understand linearly. Imagine trying to manage a modern software project today, but require that every piece of the entire stack, from the movement of bits through the CPU registers, up through the, uh, the work that the file system drivers are doing to actually manage where individual bits are stored on the hard drives, up to how data is actually moving around in memory and memory allocation. And, and, not, and I don't mean like, oh, I've got some memory, but I mean literally where on the banks of RAM are my individual bits of data stored? It's inconceivable, right? The only way you can do that is you have abstractions. You have tools that say, no, 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 we, you don't have banks of RAM. It's all just one long stream of bits. They're, they're completely connected. It, it's all fine. You're fine. You have to have these layers, these tools, these concepts to be able to think about it at all. Um, and so as you look at what we need to build to get to tomorrow. As you look at what has to change about the tools, about how we think about the world, um, we have to get there by adding more power, not more knobs. And there's a real tendency, especially in the world of software, um, to say, well, I need to do something I can't do today. Why don't I add more switches? Why don't I add a ribbon that allows me to set 972,000 things on my text editor? Um, and, and I guess what I'm saying here is don't do that. Um, you have to let go of the detail. And in a lot of cases, the reason why we add those knobs and switches is because there's this part of the place we're at today that we care deeply about. And we care about it because we're good at it, we care about it because our career was built on it or whatever. But you have to let go of that detail and you have to build new models and abstractions at this new layer. And if that new layer doesn't let go of the details of the old layer, you're kind of stuck. And if you think about SSDs, um, the, the switch to SSDs in the data center has been um, it's been a really important change, but also a pretty seamless change. Imagine a world that, where we had never built abstractions that hid the, the, the um, disk cylinders, right? Because we've had these rotating pieces of rust for a really long time, and our computers have been lying to us about the rust. It's been lying to us and saying, oh, that's, you don't have cylinders, you don't have multiple disconnected things with six platters. It's just one long stream of bits. And that way, when we replaced the spinning rust with actual long strings of bits, it was super simple, and you just kind of had to modify your drivers a little bit, and everything was just fine. And, and that was possible because of these abstractions, because of the ways that our computer lies to us. Um, and you know, I, I can't imagine building an app today that cared about CPU registers or disk caches or screen repainting. Um, I'm kind of frightened I even know that screen repainting is a thing that software can care about. Um, and, and I don't know what tomorrow's abstractions are going to be, but I know that they'll make the things that we care deeply about today, the things that in many ways define who we are and, and what makes us good, they'll make those mostly feel pretty silly. Um, and I get it that everyone who came before you was annoyingly mired in the weeds and they only cared about stuff that's irrelevant, and everyone after you is a script kitty who doesn't know anything about technology. 
Um, and you're obviously the only one true holder of the correct level of technical detail in the universe. Um, <laughs> but make no mistake, every detail that you care about right now will be irrelevant in the future. Um, don't know when, but it, won't, it will be. Um, and, and I think that we shouldn't mourn that irrelevance. I think that we should celebrate uh, no longer needing to care about stuff like this. Um, my kids are never going to build their own computer. I meet people all the time who say, you know, well, I learn computers by building this stuff myself and figuring out how to do SCSI termination or doing IDE, whatever you do with IDE drives. Um, and uh, mostly throw them away, as far as I can tell. Um, <laughs> my kids aren't going to build their own computer. They're just not. Um, not that they couldn't, but of the things that they're going to investigate, they're going to mess with, why would I make that one of them? But they just turned seven, and they've flown a drone, um, they've uh, played online video games, and they've video chatted with somebody 5,000 miles away. I had never even seen a computer when I was seven. I don't know, I think they're ahead. I think they're winning. Um, so I really think the irrelevance at one layer, allowing ourselves to stop caring about the details that are sucking us into the reality we have today, is what allows us, enables the opportunity of tomorrow. Silicon moves very, very quickly. Software moves very, very quickly. The rest of your world, again, like our brains, tend not to move nearly as quickly. It tends to be a lot slower. Um, but there's this progression, there's this path of a lot of other things trying to latch on to that world. Um, and if anything else can begin moving as quickly as software, suddenly there's this explosion. There's this movement to, oh wow, now I can actually, I can get twice as good every other year. I can get twice as good every three or four years. I think that's pretty amazing. Um, and every time it does happen, there is a bit of an explosion. And some of it is the Cambrian explosion of a variety. And some of that is the explosion of the people who were in power before. Um, and, and software is kind of eating the world, uh, for better or worse. In a lot of cases, it's, it's really good um, because it does, re improve at that rate of change. But in a lot of cases, it's also really bad because nearly everyone sucks at software. And the people who are really good at making your car, it turns out, are really, really bad at designing the software that runs your car. Um, although in some cases, they're quite good at uh, individual pieces, that, um, the parts that lie to you. But um, <laughs> there are times where I feel like there's either a corollary to Moore's law that applies to software, or a software change is just really, Moore's law has moved into the world of software from silicon, or Something, um, it doesn't really matter. Uh, Moore's Law was really always uh, an industry target. It was a thing where the industry said, um, one of us is going to double the density every 18 months or 24 months, um, and I'm going to make sure it's me and not you, because that will keep me in charge. Um, it's not really a natural law. Um, and, and I don't think in our world, in the world of software, we don't need that industry driver, because the cost of building a fab is much, much higher than the cost of doing what we do. So if we decide we're not going to move as quickly, somebody around, somebody will move around us. So um, the change is coming either way. Uh, and, and when you find that there's a place where you can't evolve anymore, a place where the change isn't interesting anymore, there's always another seam to investigate. Um, in silicon, single core performance, I mean, it's not literally done. It's going to get faster, but it's not getting very faster very quickly. But power usage uh, on a given performance level is getting amazingly, it's getting really, really good. Um, so the the speeds are still, the, the Moore's Law is still helping us, just not in the ways it used to help us. Um, drones are an example of a place where the, they're evolving about as fast as cell phones are right now. Um, I got my first consumer level drone. I didn't know that consumer level drones were as ridiculously simple and, uh, as the ones are now. I've only crashed mine four times. Um, and you look around and say, if those change in the next seven years as cell phones have in the last seven years, what does the world look like, right? What does that world look like? But what if it's not seven years? What if it's 70 years? What about 3D printers or laser etchers? There's so many things now that are moving dramatically faster than we ever thought they would. And they've reached this world where the people who build silicon and the people who build software are all moving together to make all this stuff happen. Um, yeah, I think it's pretty interesting. Um, we're not going to get to this future by making our software dumber. Um, I work with more than 100 engineers and product managers and designers. And there's always this tendency um, to believe that the next generation, believe that the people who aren't the early adopters are going to be less technical or less competent or just somehow kind of less hardcore. And the, the earliest round of feedback from any research for new products is always, well, we need to have less functionality or we need to cut all this detail out or we need to take all these things away. And I think that that's a mistake. I think that that's, that's uh, what we always found pretty quickly is, well, 
no, you just have the wrong detail. What you need to do is you always need to enable power tools. You always need to have the opportunity to have power tools at any layer. Um, and so don't confuse the fact that the details that you care about aren't details that your customers care about with uh, not building in support for details. And I think one of the most important things in building any technology, um, especially in technology for, for people like us, right, uh, is to, to reward expertise. If I get better, I want to have my tools reward me, right? If I'm way better, I want to be faster. If I've spent five years on this and you only spent six weeks on this, I damn well better be better at it than you are. Um, and, and a lot of tools, they, they don't really think about it like that. They don't, they don't reward that expertise. And I think it's incredibly critical for any of the winning evolutionary paths to really reward expertise. Um, as an aside, uh, who in the room is a manager? Yeah, you can admit it, it's fine. Um, of any of you, does a single one of you have a single power tool that was developed explicitly for managers and not for other people? So these are probably the most expensive, in general, theoretically based on how they're paid, the most valuable people in the organization they have no power tools. By they, I mean we, because I'm one of those poor suckers too. Um, and I think it's insane. I think it's insane that um, we live in software all day, we use tools all day, but they're pretty much entirely generic tools. And in most cases, they didn't go the dumb it down route. We're not using um, you know, notes to write our uh, documents. We're using Microsoft Word instead, which has literally every feature that's ever been heard of around word processors, or we're using Google Docs, which has nearly all of them, just slower. Um, but I think, it's, I think this is an interesting, uh, maybe not counterpoint, because again, managers aren't related to management in some way, but um, I think this is an area where you'll see a, a lot of really interesting tools built in the next few years. It'll be a, a multi-billion dollar opportunity paved with horrible software and destroyed companies. So fundamentally what I'm trying to say is um, success in this world isn't necessarily about technical chops, your ability that's not fundamental I'm trying to say, one of the things I'm trying to say. Um, your ability to succeed is clearly requires that you be pretty decent at technology, but being pretty decent at technology because, again, there's a sustained high rate of change. The skills you have today are going to be irrelevant at some point in the not too distant future. Um, so focusing your strengths on the individual technology skills aren't going to get you that long-term relevance. Um, so you have to ask yourself, um, how do, I, how do I move beyond just the technology skills? And that's true whether you're a person or a company. Um, you need to become an expert, but don't confuse the need for expertise with today, with its importance tomorrow. Um, every male in my family except for me is a carpenter. Are you really good with a hammer? Are you really good at building houses? Or even better, are you really good at understanding what house your customer needs and then making sure that that house comes into existence? Those are, those are pretty different, um, even if they all end up turning into using a hammer to build a house. Um, and being great at understanding and communicating, which I know all sysadmins are uh, obviously inherently good at, um, <laughs> never becomes irrelevant. And if you just look at my company, we have a choice. Uh, we have a choice between being a company that is great at Puppet and cares deeply about Puppet and it builds a world around Puppet, but at some point Puppet's gonna be irrelevant. Probably some of you in the room are thinking, going to be? Um, <laughs> Or we can choose to be great at helping our customers make their software better, faster. And there is a wrong answer, it just takes you like 10 years to figure it out, which is pretty annoying. So when you take the tech out of your job, what's left? What's your core skill? What's the thing that makes you great? What's the thing that, frankly, what's the thing that makes you happy? And what do you have the opportunity to become world class at? Um. <laughs> so I know you think that you already believe this, but I believe that you hold opinions that are essentially based on uh, the belief that mainframes aren't dead. Um, and I bet that secretly, you may not know this, but some of you at least are hoping they come back in a big way because life would sure be simpler. Um, mainframes, because, because they're so, there's just the one of them, they kind of stop the Cambrian explosion. The, the crazy amount of variety, the crazy amount of evolution that we experience today um, is, uh, is why we have this Cambrian explosion. This variety is inherently how we get the fast rate of change. If you move to a world where it's like, well, there's, there, there's, there's not, you don't have mainframes, you just have like the one, suddenly you don't have variety. Suddenly your ability to support that explosion is pretty limited. 
um, and they, they kind of can't really evolve as quickly. Um, and, and thriving ecosystems need a huge amount of variety. So any world that presumes a lack of variety, in my bad world of metaphors, is a world of mainframes, and we all agreed that mainframes are dead. But homogeneity, uh, I, get quest I get asked all the time, so Luke, what are you going to do when everybody does X? And I think all these questions presume a lack of variety. And again, presume a world that looks a lot like the old mainframes. Well, there, I mean, there's not just one, there's, there's six, let's be honest. Um, that's, you know, anything that assumes there's going to be one kind of workload or one kind of environment, there's not enough variety in that world. I, I literally cannot believe that that can exist, partially because that would crush my little heart, but also because I just believe that the, the rate of change that we're experiencing is so important to our market that if anything gets a sufficiently wide adoption that it begins to reduce that need to evolve quickly, it'll get routed around. Somebody else will find a way to introduce more variety. Um, I know obviously Borg isn't literally a mainframe, um, but again, it's a lot more like you know, this one platform that everyone has to fit into, that everyone has to work with. It's a lot more like the world of mainframes than I think people realize. And it's one thing if we say, oh, well, there are thousands of little Borgs, and they're all slightly different, and they all have all the different rates, and sometimes people install it and never change it, and sometimes uh, you know, they install it and they update it every week. That's very different. But the belief that we're going to end up with everybody running on AWS and everybody using all their platforms, everybody having every application architecture look like a Netflix-style um, web-scale workload, it's just not going to happen. And it's not going to happen not because competition matters or the government's going to step in and regulate um, how we do and do not scale our stupid web applications, but rather because that variety is what's driving our rate of change, and that rate of change is a prime driver of our ecosystem. It's a, it's a prime mandate right now. You don't get to start again. Um, everything that you do to lie to your computer and everything that your computer is doing to lie to you is going to be here and annoying people in 50 years. You can't escape the sins of the past. Um, and the majority of big customers, big companies, are running pretty much every piece of technology ever written, um, probably unlicensed. Uh, probably with a hardware dongle in the back lying to the license, um, actually literally functioning as a fake proxy for the license server to make it think that the service that hasn't worked since 1987 still works. Um, so success in our world requires working in a brownfield environment. Uh, it requires being able to say, I get that you have fancy new awesomeness, um, but also I also recognize that you have old stuff that everyone's embarrassed about. And I know that a single company, an individual organization, gets to start from scratch. And I know at some point, theoretically, all companies are new. And thus, you know, I assume that at some point, all those companies started from scratch. But across the whole market, you never get to start from scratch. And, and as a technology purveyor, as a person who builds and attempts to sell technology, I don't want to just sell to a little slice. I want to sell to the market. And once you say, I want to sell to the market, you have to care about Brownfield. And I think, in general, not literally in all cases, but in general, Successful technology companies in the management space have to say yes to everybody. Um, which means everything you build has to assume that there's stuff that sucks about your customer's environment. And, and, and saying, I'm ashamed that you're running that, um, hasn't worked out very well for us anyway. And I understand that startups are different. I understand that startups in general um, don't have legacy technology, just like they don't in general have uh, users. Um, <laughs> They're generally irrelevant, right? They don't drive revenue. Uh, they're a huge source of that variety we were talking about. Um, you know, everyone knows that the you know 90% of all startups die. Um, you know, if you look at the evolutionary chain, if you look back to the path of um, all of the variety that has existed, most of it's gone now. And some of it was successful for a little while. Um, the, all the ones that left fossils were successful. There were, there were a lot of them that did not leave fossils. So I'm not trying to say that the startups don't matter because you never know beforehand which of the, which of the 10 that's, is going to not just make it but do something that, that matters. Um, but they don't matter as, as buyers, really. They matter as sellers. They, they really change the market, but mostly as, mostly as sellers. Um, I'll be honest, this is my weakest belief. This is the one that um, if we were to find out in five years or 10 years, you know, there is, a, there is a great reset or there is now a large enough market of people who have primarily new world environments, 
such that you can ignore, not necessarily a brownfield, but you can ignore anything from before 2000 and you know, whatever the number is. Um, I feel like, you know, maybe it seems unlikely, but it's conceivable. Um, the biggest reason why I'm concerned about being wrong about this one, again, I'm not a big fan of being wrong, is the S&P 500 is turning over like a madman. The current estimates are by 2027, 75% of the current S&P 500 will uh, not necessarily be gone, but will no longer be in the S&P 500. So that's a pretty high churn rate for the 500 largest companies in our ecosystem. Um, but overall, I'd say I'm pretty confident in this. And I know what you're thinking right now. Luke, I thought you were going to talk about management software. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the implications of this on, on your world and on the world that, that I live in and that I attempt to um, browbeat other people into writing software in. Um, the world we live in, will be the, the future will be built on the past. Um, it won't just replace it. Uh, and so when you build tools in this space, I do think they have to be promiscuous. They have to be willing to say yes to everything. Um, and not literally everything, obviously, because you have concerns about security and STDs and things like that. But uh, you have to overall work with everything and, and not be snobbish about what you talk to. Um, the, w the way that I, uh, I always think about this is you know, default to yes, right? Whatever the customer wants, you have to find a way to say, mm-hmm. That being said, you would like to get rid of the old stuff and you would like to have your tools actually find a way to encourage your customers, encourage the market to get rid of the old stuff. So you have to enable what I like to think of as differential evolution. Um, support both, but support the good one in a way that it kind of encourages the customer to kind of kick the old one under the table. Um, a great example of this one is our support for Cisco boxes. We support Cisco iOS boxes and we support Cisco's Nexus boxes. And the Nexus boxes are fancy and new and everyone loves them. Cisco loves them because they're really expensive and you have bought them recently. And everyone else loves them because they aren't running iOS from 14 years ago. Um, but I don't know anybody who's saying, step one, replace the 17,000 iOS switches I have spread out throughout all of my campus and things like that. They know it's going to happen at some point, but it's not going to happen anytime soon. So when we talk to them and we say, we manage the fancy new Cisco boxes, they go, great. What can you do for the you know, umpteen billion dollars in hardware I have sitting around? And what we do is we say, look, we, we support that. You can manage it. It'll be in your environment. It'll show up. You can do audits on it. You can change passwords. You can do the basic stuff but you're gonna be much, much happier in this new world. And what that allows them to do is to really get as much of the benefit as possible of that new world, but get enough benefit in the old world that they say yes to you. And getting them to say yes is actually pretty important. Getting that complete adoption across the infrastructure is what it's gonna to take to get an organization switching over from, well, I've got a little bit of automation and a lot of people typing, which is where pretty much the entire world is right now, to, I've got a lot of change going on, a lot of, I've got a lot of things happening. So this allows the customers to adopt the new tech, uh, but gives them a ramp to the future for their old tech. And it's really been a big help for us in being a friction reducer as people, one of the projects people really want to do when they, when they begin to adopt automation is, how do I get rid of the old stuff? Um, and we really help people do that by saying, first automate it, and then slowly replace it as you can and as you care. Um, and I already talked about the detail of the present or the past being irrelevant in the future, I think a big part of what we have to do is embrace that detail going away. You have to enable the irrelevance. You have to find a way to say, yeah, yeah, I know that you've defined your life based on your ability to install packages, but you've got to let it go. Literally, one of the reasons that I wrote Puppet was I was tired of trying to figure out how to remember how to uninstall packages. Installing them all is pretty much the same. Uninstalling them apparently is much less relevant, and so everyone has a completely different flag. And it drove me crazy, and I said, I'm going to build an automation tool that never again asks me how to remove an RPM. Um, and so no, I'm, I'm not scared of things that matter to me today, things that, that I care deep about right now that you know, matter to my customers. I'm not scared of them going away. And frankly, I'd be scared if I didn't think they were going away. The idea that what our customers are relying on today still being what they rely on in critical ways in 10 or 15 years, it's pretty frightening. Imagine how little the world will have to have changed for that to, for that to be possible. Um, and then obviously we have to enable expertise. We have to enable a way to build great tools that on the one hand, nearly everyone can use. Um, our goal, my goal as a company, well, I'm, my goal as a leader of a, anyway, um, 
What we want to do is we want to help the majority of the world get closer to the leading edge. I don't have any interest in building tools for the 0.1% for the people who, who don't need any help, for the people who functionally all have PhDs from MIT. I don't have any interest in that world. Um, they can do it themselves. They don't need my help. And fundamentally, them, them doing things doesn't drive the industry nearly as much as getting the majority of the market to do things. And also, they don't buy software and uh, you know, things like that. So we want to enable expertise. Um, but again, it's important to, to not dumb things down. So you've got to build a long, flat learning curve. Um, and in the short term, it's got to be easy to use. In the long term, it's got to, be, it's got to reward expertise. It's got to really still feel like a powerful tool. Um, and last and most importantly, um, the closer we can get to management, uh, the closer management can get to what the business cares about, what the business does, the more valuable we'll become. Our abstractions will do a better and better job of approximating what matters to our customers. And I try to come up with things like resolution and fractal and asymptotes and all that kind of stuff. And there are a bunch of great mathematical words that, that talk about this process of approximation. But the main point is, IT today is pretty decoupled from the goals of the business. And DevOps is all about trying to, to realign those goals, realign why we're here in operations with why the business is here. Um, but I think, again, going back to the, uh, the abstractions that we have to build, those abstractions need to get closer and closer and closer to what the business really cares about, what the customer really cares about. Um, and ideally, management tools will be driving that part of that conversation, will we'll not just be relevant and useful, but will actually be an important part of enabling that future world. Um, and the business really, really cares about what the customer can see, and therefore the business cares about how quickly they can improve what the customer can see. Right? Our ability to deploy new software is only relevant if deploying new software helps provide a better experience for the customer. Right? You're deploying the same crappy software lots and lots of times. Isn't that helpful to, your, to, your, to, your, uh, to people who use your tools? Your ability to lash that frequency of deployment into constant improvement, into frequent improvement, um, into that high rate of evolution, that's extremely powerful. And just for a couple of closing thoughts, and it looks like I'm going to finish a little bit early. You're welcome. What really stands out to me about the future of management is how, uh, how much we still have to do. I want to say how bad it is, but really I think the future is very bright. I just don't know when it arrives. Um, Gardner says the market still uses, 15% of the market uses any kind of automation today. We're in the third generation of automation tooling, um, and no one uses any of it yet. Right? And I think it's really interesting. I think there's a lot of exciting stuff going on in our world. But the largest conference in our space is what, 1,500 people, maybe? Go to VMworld, it's 15 times that size for freaking virtualization software, right? And I get like virtualization's awesome or whatever, but like it's not that sexy. Um, but it is like 97% of the world uses it. So the distance, and then you compare us to Dreamforce, right? Everyone loves Salesforce, right? Everyone loves Salesforce. Um, 150,000 people at their conference. What needs to happen between now and then to get 150,000 people at anybody's conference in our space? So we have a really long way to go before we reach that kind of relevance. And, and I think this future, the future that we see, the future of the kind of complexity that we know is coming, it absolutely requires widespread automation. It absolutely requires a commitment to dramatically better tooling, dramatically better automation software. Um, and so I'm, I'm betting heavily on a long, interesting future in the world of management um, because I think, I think there's so much opportunity there and I'm pretty excited. Thank you very much.